Uh, as we are continuing in our study uh, on 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, we are taking a look at where David will be anointed. This is uh, his, uh, when he is now kind of uh, brought out for public view, uh, and God is going to have him anointed uh, by uh, the prophet Samuel. Uh, but the process of anointing David is actually God's way of restoring the prophet Samuel, as we saw last week. He had been really miffed at God, disappointed with the Lord, kind of, you know, a little resentful about how God does his business. Maybe you can identify with that. You may not like how God is running his universe. You may feel shortchanged, overlooked, stepped over. Uh, you may, may have some of your own feelings. You can identify with Samuel then. But more importantly, God and the, his word can identify with you. And so uh, your resentment or your disappointment is not the last stop of the train for you because God loves you. He's passionate for you. Uh, and he wants to restore you so you can be uh, blessed. His desire is to see you blessed uh, as you trust him through the difficulties, the trials, and disappointments of life. And so we're now going to see what happens with a restored prophet. What happens when this judge, priest, and prophet of Israel is restored as we now learn to see the world through God's eyes. Uh, you'll be standing for a while, uh, so uh, you'll be sitting for a while, so stand for a moment more, if you will. And let's read uh, the section from 1 Samuel 16 in unison together. Here we go. Sam also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they entered, Sam looked at Eliab and thought, Surely Adonai's anointed is before him. And Adonai said to Sam, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, but man looks at the outward appearance, but Adonai looks at the heart. Search me, O Lord. Search me, O Lord, and see if there's any hurtful thing within me. Help me to see things through your eyes, that I might love as I am loved that I might be a, a representative of the living God because of a relationship I have through the Messiah. Help us as a community and as families to represent your values as we follow you and honor you. Now guide us that we may grow together. In Yeshua's name, amen. Please be seated if you will. As we come to this section of scripture, uh, let me just say uh, uh, an opening salvo, so to speak. Uh, there are many, many believers in Yeshua. If you're a visitor, if you're not yet a believer in Messiah, uh, understand. If you haven't come to personal faith, understand there are many believers who still live defeated lives. Uh, shocking as that may seem, and how unnatural compared to what the scripture teaches us. Uh, so they live defeated lives. It's a common kind of issue. Uh, that, but there are actually some very simple solutions. Didn't say easy, I said simple. And so, let me put it this way. Believers will often fail, but followers, Talmudim or disciples, normally succeed. It's discipleship that is the means of spiritual success as you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And so, there is a difference between being a believer and a follower. We, by the way, uh, as I mentioned to the membership class this morning, uh, uh, we don't really want believers to become members here. We want disciples to become members here. People who are committed to following the Lord, to putting into place in their life uh, the very truths of Scripture uh, for their own hearts and lives. This is what we are praying for, what we seek, and what our whole program here is about, helping us all to grow as followers of the Lord. And so, as a believer, you become a believer, you become saved, you become uh, absolutely guaranteed of eternal life and heaven uh, by simple faith in what Messiah has done for you. He died in your place. 
uh, to pay for all your sins uh, and was raised from the dead to prove it all true and by simple faith in what Yeshua has done for you, not what you can do. It has nothing to do with what you can do. Simple faith in what he has done, you receive the benefits of his death. You're forgiven of your sins. You have eternal life. You're a child of God, guaranteed heaven. It's all good. But understand, uh, though you accept him as your Lord, uh, Yeshua who Adon, Yeshua is Lord, uh, though you accept him as your Lord, uh, you're going to find that you're going to grow as his disciple when you accept his discipleship, that you're going to follow his train of thought. You follow the way he thinks, the way he looks at things, his values on finances, on marriage, on life. Uh, as you follow his teachings by the grace of God, uh, you will then be a follower and blessed. The blessing comes. Uh, Yeshua said, put, he put it this way, if you know these things, blessed are you that you got to do them. You got to put them into practice. That's what the bless. That's what discipleship is about. Putting into practice, not just learning things. It's living. Torah was given to be lived, not just learned. And so, uh, when we realize the background of the story, as we have noted, uh, that God had rejected Saul as king because Saul did not believe the word of God. Wanted to do things his own way. Can't have a king like that. And so Samuel, uh, I have it on the screen as Sam, because space, etc. Not because people call me Sam. That's not the reason. Uh, Samuel, uh, he was the prophet, priest, and judge of Israel. Uh, he had actually been miffed at God. He didn't like the way God did business. He didn't like the fact that the very king he had anointed is now rejected. Uh, he was grieved over the matter uh, because of how God looked upon things, how God valued things. And so we saw that God uh, looks to restore Saul, uh, Samuel, uh, to that relationship in the ministry that he had uh, with the Lord, to give him the vibrant. In fact, this, this chapter, uh, when he joins David, is the high point of his whole ministry. For all the many, many, he's an old man at this point, for the many, 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 many decades that he had served God, the best was yet to come which he would have missed if he stayed, uh, you know, annoyed with God. Uh, and so uh, God restores him, as we saw through verse 5. Uh, but now that he's restored, he has another set of problems. Uh, now he's a believer uh, who needs to be kind of discipled all over again to have victory in the service. Uh, that's the problem as we know this, uh, the issues here. Uh, faith is trusting God even when you don't understand what he's doing. That's called faith. We walk by faith, not sight, scripture tells us. And so with Samuel, uh, here's the problem we all face. We can identify accordingly. Uh, we get re spiritually restored uh, to a relationship with God. If you basically, you know, you say, well, hold on a second. You don't know my life. You're right, I don't. I'm just guessing. Uh, but if you're, if you're still uh, this side of heaven, you have some rough spots. You have some potholes on the highway of holiness. Uh, you have some problems, difficulties, trials, troubles. Uh, you have some, you know, I didn't say it out loud moments, or yuck, I did say it out loud. <sighs> now i got to apologize to a bunch of people. And so you have those weak moments. Fair enough. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, you'll repent and be restored. Glory to God. You'll be restored because the death of Messiah paid for all your sins. But... The very stinking thinking that got you to stumble is still there. Though you may have repented and been restored, the same thinking, the same ideas, same strange values that got you to do that is still there. And so there has to be a transformation. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what the Word of God does as we become disciples. It starts uprooting all the dumb thinking that gets us into the trouble, so you might now bear fruits of righteousness, uh, etc. And so this is actually a problem that the prophet Samuel had, as we'll see in this section. Uh, and so the carnality uh, that is still at, at it's still alive and well in your thinking process 
and therefore in your emotions and in your will, your volition, all of that is keeping you from the victory God wants you to enjoy a victorious life in Messiah, more than conquerors through him who loved us. God has no other plan for the life of a child of his. No other plan, but to have victory and blessing. And so, being restored uh, uh, to the Lord, uh, faithfully relying on him, now you gotta be retrained, re-discipled. Maybe rethinking things that you had already learned, but kind of, you know, forgot about and therefore got into trouble about. And so this is what is going to be happening uh, for Samuel. We have to look at things differently. The way Samuel looked at it before got him into that bad place. Now he has to look at things differently. This is what we find in 2 Can we see 2 Corinthians 5.16 up on the screen there? Let's read it together. So from now on, we do not look at anyone from a worldly viewpoint, even if we once regarded the Messiah from a worldly viewpoint. We do so no longer. Paul thought of Yeshua as a problem for our people. He thought he was like a bad idea. And those who followed him were perpetrating and pushing forward a bad idea. So we want to understand that Paul, when he came to faith, looked at everything different. Oh my goodness. I actually used his name in vain. Oh my goodness. I'm so sad. He looked at everything differently. This is what it means to now be a follower of the Lord. Uh, he looked at, he said, oh, I once thought of Messiah as like a really problem for, and I realized he's the hope of Israel. He's the hope of the world. Oh my goodness. And now he looks on everyone differently. He looks on through God's eyes, God's perspective, by God's word, putting on your Bible glasses as such. And so the outline we have in your bulletin, uh, first of all, verse 6 and verse 7, we'll have two verses today. Uh, visitors are thinking, oh, it'll be a short sermon. That just proves your visitors. It's okay. It's all right. We all thought that way at one time. Our restrained presumption of our sensory trap, your senses are trapping you. They're tricking you. You're being deceived by your own flesh. Secondly, our retrained principles for our spiritual truth. We go uh, from a trap to truth if we allow the Word of God to have its way in us. And we'll see four things here. Stop judging by appearance, reject what God has rejected, think differently the own world, and discern the renewed heart. That's in verse 7. Start at the top, work our way down. And so as we come to the first uh, verse there, it says, when they entered, he looked at Eliab. And remember, the family of Jesse had now joined uh, uh, Shmuel, uh, Hanavi, uh, Samuel the prophet, uh, to have uh, the sacrificial meal together. Sacrifice always precedes anointing. Uh, keep that in mind when you, you say, what's that got to do with me? Your anointing comes when you trust in the sacrifice of Yeshua. You say, well, I did that 20 years ago. What about today? Not so much. Die daily. Die daily. Die to yourself. Trust in his sacrifice solely, fully, completely for everything in your life. And you'll have the anointing of God in your life. Nonetheless, uh, so they invited uh, Jesse's family. Uh, the eldest, Eliab, was the first one he saw. Biggest dude, eldest in the family as such. And so uh, he said, <laughs> deal done. This is Hashem. This is Adonai. This is the Lord's anointed before him. Woo! We're there. Quick, let's get to the food. And so, uh, the first point, the rest restrained presumption of a sensory trap. His eyes were fooling him. His lion eyes. And so Sam sees Eliab, uh, Jesse's oldest and boldest, uh, as uh, the deal. This is it. This is, this is the dude. This is great. Ready to roll here. King Hunk. Uh, I thought Saul was going to be King Hunk, but you're, you got the deal going here. This is, see, this is the problem that, that if a Samuel, what about, uh, I'm only second Samuel, remember that. <laughs> but if a prophet Samuel can be duped by his own foolishness, his own way of looking at things, how much more the rest of us, right? And so we've got to understand that we can all get deceived by our senses here, because 
what he forgot that he should have remembered was what was taught in the Torah. Remember, when we read narrative and study narrative, that is the illustration of what the Torah teaches. That's the illustration of what the Torah teaches. And so when we read the narrative now in, in 1 Samuel, we want to have it as against the backdrop of what to Torah teaches. And so in the Torah, how God chose Israel, you say, was well, because we're the cutest? Mm, you would think that. And people are often confused on that point. But no. Notice what, let's read Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8. Here we go. Adonai did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any of the peoples, for you are the fewest of all peoples. But because Adonai loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, it was not because of their great size or height or looks or any kind of other merely natural abilities or size. It has nothing to do with that. It was the sovereign will of God accordingly. You know, why did he love them? Because he loved them. God is love, not because you're so lovable. And so Samuel should have understood from the Torah that the God does not make choices based on uh, the number of people or number size of it. Listen, God is not ashamed of a remnant and neither are we because we are the remnant of Israel. God is not ashamed of a remnant and neither are we. We have to get our heads around God's values and stop thinking bigger is best and all the worldly values uh, that we can see uh, in the world around us. And so uh, we have to, first of all, beware of regarding significant appearance. Samuel uh, had love at first sight things going on with Eliab. Wow, this is a dude. You know, people look upon such things. Uh, when Eliab entered the room, it was like, woo, Samuel is swooning. Uh, Eliab hadn't talked about what he believes. Didn't have to. He looks the part. He looks the part. Uh, how, many, how many foolish people marry someone because they look the part? You know, what, what, a bunch of idiots. <laughs> bunch, bunch of idiots. Listen, ladies, I was once cute. This is what you end up with. So you better go for something more than cute. I once had that going for me. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Robert. Just saying. And so, you know, the, it's, it, he filled the soul-like profile uh, that Samuel is still working by. And so, tells you a lot of what Samuel went into the meeting looking for. He's looking for another Saul. Uh, but you can't judge a book by its cover? Sure. Why? Because as it turns out, Eliab, he hated his brother David. Well, how would Samuel know that? Exactly, you gotta ask some questions. If you're just going to you know, marry the first thing that shows up, you may be surprised what you end up with. You know, you gotta ask questions about people. That's what we do in our process here as well for membership. And so, uh, this is someone who despised the very one that God had chosen. Can you imagine that? Imagine trusting in, wanting to marry, or identify with, or hooking up with someone who God uh, has rejected. And so, uh, this is a problem we see throughout the scripture. Uh, uh, we see this uh, quite often. Uh, the, the Torah and the New Covenant, the whole Bible, forbids intermarriage between believers and non-believers. Not between Jews and Gentiles between believers and non-believers. The Bible forbids it. And so Samson, uh, he insisted on marrying a non-believer because he said, she looks good to me. <laughs> and so because he made decisions based on his eyes, he lost his sight. What you sow this also will you reap what you sow you reap. By the very values that you live by, 
those will be the values that come up and bite you. And so we have to appreciate the truth of Scripture on the matter. And so people do what's right in their own sight. Why? Because uh, they marry, they decide to marry someone, they want to get married. And so they, want, they get married. Regardless of views or values or whatever, he said he believed in God. <laughs> she, said, she, said that she, she said she loved God. Really. So you've got to do much more than just, you know, do surface kind of things here. Uh, being spiritually blind. Some people are spiritually blind, though they claim to be believers. You say, how could that be? Because you only see things correctly through the scriptures, through God's values. Only the Bible tells you the reality of what you're looking at. The Bible is your guideline. It is the plumb line. Your senses will deceive you every time. And so we've got to be careful of this ignorant irreverence that he showed. He uses the Lord's name here on the deal as if that caps it off, you know. Oh, this must be Adonai. Yeah, right. You're wrong on several counts now. Now you're using his name in vain. And so ignorant of God's will, he thinks his will is God's will. That's what happens for every person who doesn't know and follow the word of God. They think their will must be God's will because it just seems so right. There's a way that seems right unto man. But the end thereof leads to death. Be careful of leaning on your own wisdom, on your own reason. Or follow the word of God in your marriage, in your families, at work, wherever you may be here. And so uh, this is the issue. Uh, so God had rejected Saul. Uh, and, and therefore rejected the worldly standards uh, that Saul brought in. You say, well, I thought, wasn't Saul anointed and all that? Saul, as I mentioned before, when we took a look at this in depth when we studied 1 Samuel chapter 8, Saul was the choice of Israel because they wanted a king like all the nations. They wanted to sit at the cool kids' table. They wanted a king like all the nations, with the worldly values of the nations that came with it. And so therefore, they got Saul, a king like all the nations. Can you imagine marrying someone because you want a husband like everyone else? I want a wife like everyone else. What kind of crazy thinking is this? Can you imagine such a thing? It happens every day. And so... Uh, when he, 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 those are not going to be a king like all the nations. And so Samuel's ignorance of God's standards now makes him irreverent. Here he is, the prophet of Israel, being irreverent, uh, etc. As if God is a placebo and that my faith determines his will. What false teaching people buy into. Whatever I confess, God will do. Really? Really, I insist you confess that I'm good looking. Let's see how quickly God answers that one. Of course, it may blind you, so I may appear good looking, not you. God is not a placebo. In prayer, we yield ourselves to his will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done, Yeshua taught us. And so be careful of false teaching that makes you think everything that you think is right is right. Only the word of God is right, and it will help you discern. Sound teaching is for the mature who, because of, because of practice, using the word of God, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And so uh, he therefore uh, had a lot of arrogance here. He says, surely, you get that? <laughs> Deal done. Nailed it, got it, first time. I'm like that. I'm a prophet. I can tell these things. Surely, false certainty, you know? Sometimes you get a false positive from the doctor, like the dude up there who's being told that he's pregnant. Another false positive. 
And so a lot of people go by what's right in their sight, what they think is right, what, what really, it's their lust, like Samson and now Samuel. And so uh, all the certainty by appearance uh, based on our ignorance of God's word. As we've studied, when we studied the book of Romans, it shows that ignorance always leads to arrogance. You see, people who are arrogant is because they're ignorant of God's word. Therefore, they trust in their own thinking. Being ignorant of God's word, Romans 11, verse 2, God has not forsaken the people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scriptures say? Do not be arrogant, verse 16 and 17 says, do not be arrogant against the natural branch. Ignorance leads to arrogance every time. And so this was the problem. He wasn't going by the word of God. He was going by how things looked to him. And even if he had the label, he had the title, he had the name, but he didn't have the game. He had to be retrained in the Lord. And that's what God's going to do for him and us now as we take a look at verse 7. Our retrained principles of, for spiritual truth. And so Hashem said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or height. And so we have to stop judging uh, by appearance and externals. Uh, this is actually what is assumed in God's will for your life. God's will for your life has nothing to do with how you evaluate things and everything to do with how he evaluates things. You may not see the will of God because you can't, you think your will is the will of God and you're not going by the word of God. But she looks good to me. Famous last words. Beware of thinking and raising your children like that. You'll raise your children to think just like that, and there will be a disaster for them as well. And so when it says there, it's in a command for do not look, stop it. When it has the negative form there, it's like stop doing this. Stop thinking like this. Stop looking at things this way. Uh, the word there for regard is used also to become dependent. I have a portion up there to show you. Uh, so the word regard uh, in the Hebrew uh, can be dependent. Are you dependent on your own value system? Are you dependent upon your own senses? We are to walk by faith, not by sight. Our sensory issues are not to be trusted apart from the word of God. This is what gives us victory. This is what brings about the spiritual success God called us to have in our Messiah. In the victory as he, as he was raised bodily from the dead. So we also have uh, the newness of life in him. And so this verse is actually translated uh, in the NET version. Don't be impressed. So some of us are overly impressed with people according to the flesh. Uh, worldly values and things like this kind of thing. Uh, and so you say, well, what do I do? You need to make teshuvah. You need to repent of how you look at things. Not just the actions that are the result of how you look at things. You see what I'm saying? Some of us, when we get caught, repent. It's like that chaplain in prison. Remember him? The chaplain in prison, he was visiting one of the prisoners. He saw the guy weeping and crying. And he said to the guy, you probably feel really sorry about what you did. And the prisoner looked at the chaplain and said, yes, I feel very bad. Next time I'm wearing gloves. You're only repenting because you get caught. You're missing the point. It's the thinking, thinking that got you there. That's what God's working on. Uh, for your mind to be having the mind of Messiah by the word of God in your life. You need to repent of all these wrong things. And so we die to self. When Yeshua said this is what bears fruit, when we die, die to ourselves. So I die to my way of thinking. I die to all of those things. You say, but you're a Jew. You're supposed to look at things Jewishly. I died to everything Jewish. I died to everything worldly. And only as the word of God teaches. Now I have God's way of looking at things, even to the Jew first. God's way, as God's Jew, as God's male. But you were born male. I am God's man now. And I will be God's man. 
despite what the world thinks about those things. That's why we want the guys to be involved in, in, our, in the brotherhood ministries, because this is a way for us to grow together as men of God. And so we die to ourselves, die to dependence on all those things, to the appearance of things. And so we don't judge by appearance as Yeshua taught us, but judge with righteous judgment, word of God accordingly. And so uh, appearance is a problem. This is what God our Messiah killed. It was prophesied. Let's read the portion from Isaiah uh, 53. Let's read verse uh, 2 and 3 here, if we will. Here we go. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. This is why he was rejected. He didn't fit the part. He didn't play the game. He didn't try to fit into worldly standards, but yet we follow him, contrary to the way the world thinks. He was too plain, too punished, too passive, as Isaiah 53 brings out. Uh, so this is why he was rejected, but nonetheless, he is the truth. He is the truth. The world was wrong. God is right. And so the best gifts for your life usually come in humble wrapping. Uh, Naomi, if you've uh, been involved with our teaching on the book of Ruth, uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 21, Naomi, after uh, years of disobedience to God, comes back uh, to Bethlehem, and she has some uh, Moabite uh, pe uh, woman with her named Ruth. So you know Ruth and know her reputation. It's like, wow, that's cool. She didn't think so. She came back, and Ruth 1, 21 said, God has been bad to me. I left full. I come back empty. She didn't realize the very blessing that God had given her. She missed it because it was wrapped in a Moabite package. There are some people who think, how can God bless if, you're, if you love Gentiles? Can you imagine such stupid, stinking thinking? You're missing the blessings of God. There's one God, there's one people. We're those people, together in him. And so uh, we need to repent of all these ways of looking at things in order to have righteous judgment. Uh, moving on now, let's take a look at the principles God's going to lay down uh, for uh, Samuel. Reject whatever God has rejected. Whatever God has rejected, whatever God has rejected, uh, their appearance or approval, uh, whatever it is, uh, none of it is going to make them acceptable. If God's rejected it, we dare not accept it. And so uh, you have to know how, how does God look at these things? What's the, you know, the world is kind of... Simple, beauty, brains, and bucks. Brawn may be put in with Arnold. Uh, beauty, brains, and bucks. Usually how the world evaluates, you know, success and acceptability and all that. Uh, this is just contrary, of course. Without godliness, it's all useless and wasted. God rejects it. But do you reject it? Or do you still hunger and thirst for the things that the world finds acceptable? And so those who reject God's word are rejected by God. Those who reject God's word are rejected by God. I have a, a plethora of scriptures up there uh, to show you that the whole Bible speaks of this. That whoever rejects the word of God is rejected by God. It's a real simple thing for you to figure out. When you're talking to people and you want to know if they're your friends, bring up some Bible issues and see where they're at. If they say, well, you know, you say, well, I, I think that abortion is murder. Say, what, are you crazy? A woman has a right to choose. Whoop. We can be friendly, but not friends. You're killing babies. We, I don't hang with people who kill babies. Can I hear an amen? amen. Okay. This side was bad. Pray for that side of the room. <laughs> I'll now put my attention over here more. I was, I was expecting a bit more from this side of the room, just saying. Okay. Uh, so understand, uh, this is how it is. This is what happened with Saul, as I have up there from 1 Samuel 15, uh, 26. And so the prophets all said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, not knowing the truth, but living by tradition instead. Rejecting God's holy standards is rejecting the holy God. 
We are called to be a holy people, set apart unto him. We're to be more loving. We're to love those who are, the world thinks is unlovable. We love the least of his brethren. We care. We reach out to people that people that the world thinks are throwaway people. There are no throwaway people. God cares for all of them, and so do we. Uh, and we want you to understand that so you can convey that to your children as well uh, when they're going to school and understand these things. Uh, and so this is how the Bible reads from cover to cover, uh, that we are called to be a holy people. He's called us for, uh, for sanctification, not impurity. And those things that you watch on TV or the internet that are impure, you're now actually uh, rejecting a holy God when you say yes to those evil things. And when you do those things, your children will think this is the, what he means. I mean, I can be a believer and watch those things. That's what you're teaching your children. You're modeling for your children. You say, well, hold on a second. I don't think they catch me doing it. I just caught you. You're caught. Repent of that. Repent of that. Grow still more in these matters. That the Lord may be honored. Those who reject Yeshua, the Messiah, are rejected by the God of Israel. For they've rejected God's only means of salvation. Now, there'll be some people, I'm sure, maybe someone's live streaming or someone visiting with us. There's, listen, Sam, there's a lot of people in this world. Uh, good grief, there's lots of religions, lots of people. Uh, yeah, but there's only one God. I mean, if there were two gods, maybe there are two ways to get to each one. But there's only one God. So there's only one way that he has for us to get to him. There's only one God, one way of salvation. And so the stone which the builder rejected, indeed, chief of the corner, even as we sang earlier today. As Yeshua said, he rejects me does not and does not receive my teaching, has one who judges him. The word I spoke will judge him on the last day. And so we have to understand the same. Well, who God rejects, we must also reject. Sam had to reject Eliab. God had rejected him. Because uh, God had rejected, uh, God, uh, because Eliab had rejected David. It was a clear indication. If he had asked some questions, done some homework here, this was God, David's God's anointed. And so too, those who reject the Messiah, the son of David, we cannot accept on such terms. Oh, we want to love everyone. We want to, lo we love everyone. We, we, we're crazy. We uh, crawl over glass uh, to bring good news to a Muslim. I love everyone, everyone, but understand they're only accepted into fellowship through Yeshua, through Yeshua. And so we have to understand what God teaches. And so if you're here and you're saying, hold it a second, what about me? I, am I rejected too? If you do not accept the Messiah, yes. Your sins have already rejected you. Your sins have set you apart from God, have separated you from him. Your sins have done that. That's why you need Yeshua to die. He died in your place to have that forgiveness of sin. Therefore, though I was rejected, a broken off branch, by the grace of God in the Messiah, I have been regrafted in, I have been accepted in the beloved. Not because of me, because of Yeshua. That's the key issue for our lives. And so God looks at things differently. Verse 7 continues, For God sees not as man sees. See everything differently than the world does. Uh, the world, you know, I have a, have a dear friend. I won't mention his name because he's pretty well known in the Messianic world. But he has a rotten sense of direction. When we would drive together, and he would say, Go right. I knew that meant go left. Oh, yeah, I think that's right, he would say. <laughs> Always. Well, because of sin, the world has a rotten sense of direction. It's heading straight for the pits. We want to understand we're going to have to look at things differently. We have to look at things different than the world looks at things. Uh, the way God looks at things is the way we need to look at things. What God regards, uh, this is what we look at. This is what we regard. Uh, what God disregards, this is what we disregard as well. 
uh, all humanity uh, regards what God doesn't see and disregards what God does see. Uh, he can see uh, people as, as beloved, but yet millions of babies are being aborted every year. Can you imagine women killing their own babies? Can you imagine that? The heartbreak of it shows the total depravity of humanity that such a thing could be done. And so God looks at it differently. Uh, he also looks for different people in the world does. Uh, let's read together from Numbers chapter 14, 24 regarding Caleb. Uh, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I'll bring him into the land. He and Joshua were the only ones who had a different spirit. They followed after God. Uh, God is looking for such people as this. Israel saw Caleb as part of the problem. Ten spies gave a report that said, save yourselves, don't go into the land, there's giants there, there's trouble, there's problems. Caleb and Joshua, the only two, said, God is bigger than the giants. God is greater, let's trust him. But they wanted to kill Caleb and they wanted to kill Joshua because they stood up for God. But Caleb and Joshua were the only ones of that generation who got into the land. Why? Because they had a different spirit than the world. And so God is looking for those who have the Holy Spirit leading them and guiding them, directing them, filling them, empowering them to make a difference uh, in this life. And so we have to, this, let me ask you a question. Would God see you as different? Or would he just see you like you say, I'm as good as the next guy? Good enough for you? Be careful. You're called to be different than the next guy. You're called to be a light in the darkness. Salt and light to make a difference in this world. And so God expects our discipleship to make us different than the world we're in. Uh, we're not looking to fit into the world. We're not trying to succeed by the world's standards. Uh, God can give the increase. If you have good business practices, uh, you might be able to make a living. Uh, but if you decide that I'm going, whatever it takes to become a billionaire, uh, you're going to find yourself going the way uh, of all failures as well. And this has to do with proper teaching, getting the practice. This is always the case, the difference between clean and unclean, uh, the, the, between the holy and the profane, as the scriptures tell us here. And so we're called to be different, and when you see life differently, like God, then you'll be different like God. You'll be godly. People are godly, that's an adverb, which means they are like God in those days. And so when you use your finances as God teaches you, you're being godly. He can bless you because you're godly. When you are now sharing your faith with people because he cares about them, you're now you're looking at them the way he does, you're caring about them, you're sharing good news with them, you're now being godly and he can bless you for being godly as opposed to godless which is doing things your own way, contrary to what God said. This is what Shmuel the prophet, Samuel the prophet had to learn. So much, if so him, how much more me and you? We all have to grow in this. And so we have to look at the renewed heart here. It says here, uh, man looks on the outward appearance, God looks at the heart, he sees your heart, he sees, hears all your thoughts. And so the renewed heart, God looks upon our hearts. He looks upon our hearts. This is what he looks for. This is where your faith is really. You know, and that we confess our faith indeed uh, in order to testify accordingly that Yeshua is Lord. We're unashamed of him. We're not ashamed of Messiah, not ashamed of the good news. But it's our heart that God is looking at. And then our heart will overflow into speech properly. And so uh, God, can God discern your heart? Can you see what's going on there? This is how we, and when you grow in him, and you know the word of God, listen carefully, you can evaluate and discern where people are coming from as well. This is what Yeshua said, uh, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Your heart is always being revealed through what you say. Your heart's being revealed through what you say. And so this is what Yeshua taught us. This is how we grow together. When you know God's word, you can evaluate accordingly. When you don't know God's word, you don't know what to think uh, about anything, etc. And so there's four ba biblical bases of authority in the Bible. 
Uh, when you read through the whole Bible, I have going to put it up there real quickly for you. You need to take your pictures or download accordingly. For a biblical base of authority in the human heart, this is what motivates people to make their decisions, right or wrong, why I bought the car, why I married that man, uh, why I bought that house, why I live over here. All the decisions you make have to do with what motivates you, the authority in your own soul that you depend on and look to. And so, uh, people who go by experience, as the scripture tells us, uh, you can be dead wrong when you go by experience, when they're talking, you hear them say, I feel, I feel, I feel, they're feeling oriented, and so experience oriented people, and so how do you know the, that, that it's, you know, Mormonism is a cult and, and, and has false teaching, but what they do, they go around to people who consider themselves Christians, and say to them, well, we just want you to pray about it. If you feel something, then you know God's at work. You know, once, once in a while, someone's going to feel something. And they say, oh, it must be, uh, they become Mormons. Can you imagine? It's the word of God that's true. Your feelings can deceive you. If you don't know that, you end up with all kinds of strangeness in your life. Uh, reason of, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses is a cult because they deny the truth of who Yeshua is. Uh, but this is their basic premise. If it's unreasonable, it's untrue. Really? Really? That's how, that's how, but the Bible says God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Hello? Hello? You need a God that's bigger than you. Praise God for a peace that surpasses comprehension. Amen? Yeah. I'm sure God isn't in is in is Nadler's size. I'd have to save him. <laughs> Poor dear. <laughs> We'd all be in trouble. Tradition. Uh, I grew up in a traditional mode. This is how we thought. This is how we thought, talked about things. You heard us say the word we. Because uh, we're representing a community value. Uh, what our community holds to. And this is how, and you can evaluate accordingly. And then finally, the scriptures. You say, well, what does it mean if you have the word of God as the foundation of authority in your life? You're going to talk about him. You're all about him, the living word of God. This is what our life is about, glorifying him, uh, testifying of him. And so everything else, everything else is the Holy Spirit's working on uprooting, getting rid of all those kind of things that you have in your soul that does not reflect the truth of God. He's uprooting it. He's challenging you on all those matters that you repent of it. All those weeds and everything else that's choking out the good seed accordingly. And so, does your heart reveal God's heart? Does your heart reveal God's heart? What do you mean? Closing your hand to the poor reveals a loveless heart, as the scripture teaches us. Teaching the precepts of men reveals a heart far from God. We teach the word of God. Divorcing your spouse reveals a hardness of heart. You say, well, we're not getting along. Repent! Repent! You're out of God's will. You need to repent that he might renew your first love and make your marriage a testimony of his grace, of his grace. Making amends with those you offended reveals a humble heart. Giving to God's work reveals your willing and spiritually inclined hearts. Grief in your heart over the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This reveals a heart connected to God for his love is inseparable. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Yeshua the Messiah. What breaks his heart, he weeps over Jerusalem and therefore our, our hearts weep as well. And so we need to be set apart unto the Lord in our hearts. That's where it's at. In your heart, set apart unto him. A little bit more, we grow more and more. And so maybe there's areas of your life you can set apart unto God. Areas uh, that really are going to make the difference. You say, well, what do you mean? Let's review quickly. One, stop judging by appearance. Accept Messiah, who's rejected by the world. Accept him, and you'll be able to look at life as God sees it and have the victory God has for you. Reject what God has rejected and stop, repent of displeasing him by finding acceptable everything he finds 
horrendous and, and horrible. Think differently than the world. Be a light in the darkness. Don't try to fit in how dark you can be. Be a light in the world. Discern the renewed heart. Evaluate everything by the word of God. And you'll see Yeshua exalted in your life and blessings to, all over the place. Well, for those of us who were indeed rejected because of sin, our sins rejected us, even though God loved us, and therefore we found the grace of God to trust in him and be forgiven of our sins, become children of God, uh, we now implore you, don't allow pride to keep you from the men's conference and even worse, from eternal life. Don't allow your pride to keep you from what God has for you. Come to him. Turn to him. Trust. Simple faith what God has done for you in the Messiah. Let's pray together. And Father, we pray that we might have the mind of Messiah and might think about things uh, that you have in your word. That these, your word might be our thought life. And we might see things as you see things and love people the way you love people and be sacrificial in our lives as you sacrificed for us. And so we ask for your blessing upon us to that end. And so even now, speak to our hearts. And while your hearts are bowed before God, eyes closed, ask the Lord to help you in some areas. Uh, we'll have our prayer and worship team in the front to pray with you. I'm going to close with a simple prayer right now. If this prayer reflects your need to trust in the Messiah once and for all to be your, uh, to, for forgiveness of sins and new life, pray this with me. But if you're already a believer, but you're realizing there's a lot of areas that are stinking thinking, I need to use this prayer for rededicating those areas. God, here's your heart. In your heart, pray with me. Dear God, forgive me for my willfulness. Forgive me for my vanity. Forgive me for my foolishness. Thank you for cleansing my sins in the Messiah, Yeshua. In his name, amen.